as I have alluded to already several times, our reading this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, the third chapter beginning with the 13th verse, and this is the story of the baptism of Jesus according to Matthew. Um, So hear these words. When Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, just as he came up from out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. May God add God's blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and to the understanding of God's holy word. Amen. So I went back and listened to the sermon from last week, and I don't often do that, but I realized I yelled at y'all a lot last week, so I want to apologize. I'd like to say it's not going to happen again, but I don't know. I got a little fired up last week. You missed it, Dan. I, uh... Anyways, so this week, um, we will look at the baptism of the Lord, and then next week we start a three-part series. I just want to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up um, that we'll start a three-part series in which we're going to be looking at the great statements of the Bible. So we're going to talk about the great requirement, which is found in Micah. We're going to talk about uh, the great commandment found in John and the great commission, which is found in all four Gospels and Acts. And so for the next three weeks, we'll be sort of looking at these great statements um, and, and what those mean to our lives as, as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. But this morning, we wanted to give you an opportunity. Again, we, I still consider January. I, I wrote my first check today as I was writing it in the church. So for the first time, I wrote 2014 down. So it's still early enough in the year for us to, to sort of start afresh. And, and even, like I said last week, if you've broken your, your resolutions that you made, here's another opportunity for you to come and to, to be washed clean as we talk about baptism. Um, I was surprised a few months ago when we were doing our confirmation class, we had a lesson on baptism. And for some of our parents who were here um, with those confirmands, they brought stuff from their uh, baptism of their child. And most of the children didn't remember being baptized because all of our kids, all 11 of them, had been baptized as, as infants. And so they didn't remember their baptism. And I invited their parents to come and to, to simply talk about their baptisms and to, to show things that they had, had kept and had hung on to. And I was amazed um, at how much stuff the parents had saved. Um, It made me feel really bad as a parent because I don't have any of that stuff for my kids. Um, And I'm a preacher. But anyways, uh, it it was amazing to watch the parents and you could see the pride. Some of you are here. See the pride as they talked about the the gown that their child wore or or the, uh, the different things that went on in the life of the service and who did it and what church it was at. And, And it just was so special. Even though the children didn't remember it, uh, the parents did. Uh, Many of you were baptized in the United Methodist Church, and you probably don't remember your baptism, but, but what I would say to you is that somebody does. Somebody still remembers your baptism, um, and that's a special thing. Even if you're more experienced, somebody somewhere probably remembers your baptism, and that's a special thing. Uh, because it's, it, it's special when we enter into the body of Christ together, when we, when we do the thing that, that Christ did as we remember His. It's one of our only two sacraments that we have in the life of the church. We did the other one last week with communion. And, and this week we're talking about baptism. We're not actually going to be baptizing anybody this week. Next week we will, but, but not this week. Um, but this is one of only two, commu- um, two um, uh, sacraments that we celebrate. Uh, in the life of our, of our church together. 
And so by looking at Jesus' baptism, that's what today is, and this is the lectionary. So this is other churches all around the country are, are also talking about Jesus' baptism today. I didn't just pull this out of the air. This is the, the day in which we, we stop as the church and we look at this day. So as we look at it, I want us to look at, at Jesus' baptism, what we can learn from it, but then also what we can, what it says to us about our baptism or, or what it says to us about uh, being a believer uh, in, in the light of, of Christ. And so there's three words, and you can obviously guess what those words are because they're the sermon. Claimed, named, and aimed. All right? This isn't rocket science here. Claimed, named, and aimed. This is what happens in the life of Christ's baptism. First and foremost, Christ is claimed. Not only is Christ claimed, but, but Christ makes a claim. God, in the flesh of Jesus Christ, makes a claim. Because He agrees or identifies with us. Have you noticed this theme we've been hitting on for the last, I don't know, it's been three or four weeks. We keep coming back to this. Jesus putting on the flesh and becoming like one of us. He who was sinless went down into a river in which people were being baptized and washed clean of their sin. That's what, that's what John was doing. John was at the Jordan River baptizing people, washing them clean of their sins. They would repent and they would return and, and go back to life. Jesus didn't need to do this. But yet He did. Demonstrating to us once and for all that, that, that He's one of us. He's one of us. A friend of mine was telling me about a Lenten devotion that, that made light of this. And, and in this devotion, uh, I think his name is Robert Burbage, talks about that this is like a fishbowl. How many of you have fish? Anybody have fish? I know a couple of you do. It's like a fishbowl. And in order for that fish to know that you love it, what you would do is you would get in the bowl with the fish. <laughs> but what would happen to that fish? Number one, it would be a little bit overwhelmed. And number two, it would probably be washed out and it would die. So what we're saying here, what he was saying, what Mr. Burbage was saying based upon this, this concept of Jesus becoming like one of us is that, that God became a fish. You catch that metaphor? Like you and I. That God became the fish and got in the fish bowl so as not to scare or freak out or completely devastate humanity. That God didn't come down with power and thunder yielding thunder, lightning bolts and, and, and throwing stones and, and massive amount and moving heaven. And, no. God became one of us so as not to overwhelm us. So you and I could know the intimacy of God ever more clearly. God was no longer behind a, a curtain kept with only the holy and the most sacred people entering into. Instead, God was now available to all. God claimed humanity. God also claimed Jesus that day, saying, this is my son. This is where we're getting ready to start talking about the Trinity. And, and you start trying to figure out the Trinity in your mind, and your head's just going to start spinning round and round. This is just one of those things that we take on faith. God became flesh, dwelt among us, spoke down from the heavens, saying, this is my son. I claim him. And God, at baptism, claims you. We have a song, actually, we sing it, it's in the, uh, sometimes we sing it, it's in the faith we sing, God claims you. Blank stares, so obviously we don't sing it here, but <laughs> trust me, there's a song in the faith we sing called God Claims You. I'd sing it, but I don't know all the words. Okay. That's right. <laughs> God claims you takes hold of you, says you are my child. <clears throat> Secondly, we're named. The voice calls down from heaven and said, this is my son. So, so Jesus is 
proclaimed. Jesus is named. This is my Son, the Beloved. The Greek word there is agapetos. You recognize that? Agapetos. The Beloved. This is my Son, also named Love. This would become the defining point of who Jesus was for the world. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Love becomes the, the defining characteristic of who we are as God's people. Because we're supposed to love God and love one another. And we're named. So just as Christ is named as the Son, Christ is named as the Beloved, we too, as we gather together when we're baptized, we're named. And it's not necessarily the, the God-given name that, that our parents throw on us, but instead we are named Christian. We are named children of God. The most important name you'll bear in your life. I've told you that before, that, that one of the, the defining points in my life was the realization that, that when I was asked who I was, and I would go through this litany of things of, of being from a certain place, and, 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 and doing this, and doing that, and doing this, and, and, and I didn't realize that it wasn't until later on down the list, after I'd gotten finished listing everything that, that I felt made up my identity, that I would come down to being a Christ follower. And the reality was is that that should have been the first thing that I claimed was that name as a, a Christian. When I define myself, it defines everything that I do in my life. You're a child of God. It's a claimed name, last one, and this is the big one. Aimed. Jesus was aimed. Let me, let me break down the scene there for you. So John is there in the wilderness. Let's, let's not look past this. John could have been doing his baptisms uh, in a little stream or in a little river somewhere near Jerusalem because, well, there would have been a lot more people who he could have had an impact on. But instead, John the Baptist goes out into the wilderness to the Jordan River in order to baptize people. So he's at a place that, that not many people typically will find themselves, will be associated with in the wilderness, baptizing people. But this river was special. You see, the Jordan River was the, the place in which Joshua had to lead the people across in order to get into the promised land. And so this river, in the minds of the people during John's time, was sort of that barrier, that boundary that, that you had to cross in order to, to walk into the new life that God had promised for them. And so here, John the Baptist was baptizing the people, initiating yet again that remembrance in their mind, hitting that trigger in their mind that they could go as faithful Jews and say, hey, we've been here before. Our people have been here before, crossing this same river into new life. And now John is offering us new life. And Jesus would be offering us new life. And not just any new life, but abundant new life. The other point is, is that Jesus' ministry has not yet begun. This is not even... He hasn't done anything up until this point. He comes to John to be baptized and this is the beginning of what awaits and how the world would be changed. And this is the moment. See, that's what we've taken. We, take, we don't take that into account sometimes that, that we think baptism, baptism is like sort of the end. We, we're ushered into the, the to body of Christ when we're baptized and when we're confirmed, we, we affirm that and then we're good. But baptism is a beginning. As we gather children together, as we baptize a child, we say this is the beginning of your new life and we're going to do our darndest to raise you up in a way that, that God would have us to. And when we 
confirm kids and when we lay hands on them and, and we affirm what they have, have done and, and when we every time we come together and we, we gather over some, some simple water and you're offered an opportunity to dip your hands in it and to, to feel the same substance that was placed on your head so long ago or maybe not so long ago. To remember who God is calling you to be. But then there's a bigger picture. There's a bigger picture than all this. There's always a bigger picture. Do you realize that? There's always a bigger picture. Keep that in mind. There's always a bigger picture. Because no matter what you're going through in life, this isn't in my notes, but no matter what you're going through in life, there's a bigger picture. Because we get so consumed by seeing this little tiny tunnel vision picture of what my life is and, and how this affects me and what, what's going on. There's a bigger picture, friends. We can't see it right now. We may not ever see it. But we're told there's a bigger picture. This is another one of those things that we just have to sort of take on faith. That God's with us. So there's a bigger picture even with baptism. N.T. Wright says this. He says, The primary point of baptism is not so much that it does something to the individual, but that it defines the community defines the community. Up until this point, I've talked to you and it's been all sort of about your individual baptism and what baptism means for us and what Jesus means for us. But the overarching theme of baptism is what it does to the community. Go back to the reading that Helen read to us. I'm glad she read this morning. She did it with such power and there was one point in time she even startled me with, this is what God said. It's great. Go back to that reading. And if you need to, go back and look at it later on today. Take your bulletin with you before you go to Ladles and take it there. Write down the Isaiah 42, 1 through 9. And go back and read it. Because it, it, it speaks in such a way. These were unprecedented words, friends. These words had never been spoken before in the history of humanity. That God was speaking through the prophet and says this, I have given you as a covenant to the people. I have given you. Up until this point, the covenant had always been with them. Abraham had been given a covenant. God said, I'll covenant with you. Moses, I'll covenant with you. Noah, the, ark, the, the rainbow, covenant with you. I'm going to say, I'm never going to destroy you again through water. Here's a rainbow. Believe it. Covenant with you, with you, with you. But the Isaiah says, no. I'm giving you as a covenant people to someone else. They were the covenant. They were to take God's love to the world. That's what Jesus was. Jesus was our covenant to the people. Uh, the covenant to us. God's way of, of putting on the flesh and saying, I'm coming to you so that then you may go to others. So through the baptism, through baptism, through, through this practice of, of taking water, and we don't take stones, but, but taking water, and when we remember our baptism, when we place our hands in this water. We rub it around. We make the, the sign of the cross on our foreheads or on our hands or, or whatever it is we want to do. We're remembering the covenant that was made by God through Jesus Christ. That God would love the world in a new and amazing way the powers and the principalities and all that looks uh, to be doom and gloom around us and all of that that weighs upon us so heavily no longer has the last word. But there's a bigger picture. And that bigger picture is God's love. So here's what we're going to do. Like I said, you're going to give an opportunity to come forward if you would like. Um,
to be able to take your to, to dip your hands in the water to remember your own baptism or if you haven't been baptized to remember Christ's baptism to think about what that means you're offered to to grab a stone out of here I, I, I've talked to several people who who still have stones from the last time we did this or time before that, or the time before that. They carry it around in their pocket, and they, every now and again they, they hit it, and they remember who they are and who they're supposed to be. So you're, you're offered that opportunity to come and to, to think about your own relationship with God. Some of you don't need to do that. Some of you instead need to come and to think about your relationship with the community and how you can better serve with us here. Because God's calling you to something. You're being claimed, you're being named, you're being aimed in some significant way this day. And, and you need to think about that, and that's fine as well. The band's got a couple of songs prepped and ready. So, so they're going to play, and if they've got to go longer, Dan said he can just wing it. Even though he doesn't feel good, he can wing it. So take your time. Think about what this means for you. Think about what this means for the, the life of our community together as we, as we reaffirm, re, recommit, as we remember Christ's baptism in, in light of our own baptism and in light of the community. Of what it means to, to be called together, to come together as, as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And, and the other part of this is we're not taking up an offering today. Stop. We are taking up an offering. <laughs> We're not passing the plates. Let me say that. We're not passing the plates. So as you come up to, to remember your baptism, if you would then bring your offering with you and place it in one of the four plates that's sort of set up here, if you aren't comfortable coming forward, if you can't come forward, we'll get you know, a, an opportunity for you to come after the service to either do the, the baptismal remembrance or to, to place your offering in the plates. Okay, one of, the, one of those two ways. I don't want anybody to, to be left out with this. Um, but this is how we're going to remember. And so I pray that you would, would come as you feel led. I'm going to pray for us right now. The band's going to get ready. I'm going to pray for us. Um, and as they start to sing, just simply come. Take your time. We're not in any rush. I didn't go that long. It's only 9.30, so we're good. you got 15 minutes. Relax. Take a nice deep breath. Enjoy the beautiful music. Enjoy the presence and the feeling that's here. And enjoy the fact that Christ was baptized so that we would be baptized so that we could then go and share the love of God with all the world. So let's pray. Holy Father, we are ever grateful. We are ever in awe of Your love for us for all the many ways in which we fall short and yet you are still there to, to pick us up and to dust us off and to send us on our way, to, to wipe our tears, to tend to our wounds, and to simply be love for us. God, we're thankful for your Son Jesus who came and who lived among us, who put on the flesh and to experience life as, as we experience it. Who would know our, our pains, who would know our hurts, but, but God who would also know our joys and the great celebrations that we have. So now as we come, as we come to remember our baptism or to come to remember Christ's baptism, come to recommit or to Renew to refresh our lives yet again at the beginning of this year. We give you thanks for all that you've done for us and for all that you have waiting for us. We pray your blessings to fall upon us and to be upon this water that it would, would add, be more than, than just simply water and, and a simple stone, but that it would become sacred, it become holy this time and this place would be what you would want it to be for us. God bless us as we seek to live our lives as a blessing for others. It is in your Son's precious, holy, and sacred name that we pray. Amen.